And so, Lord God, we pray that uh, we would do that. We wouldn't let the thorns and thistles grow. And that we would invite you, Lord Jesus, to be born in us. So I pray that you would cause us, Lord God, to preach. Or that you would preach. That you would preach through us. So, Father, we pray um, over all the, the equipment that's like been giving us a little bit of a fit lately. We pray over people watching online now and later and over us in this room, Father, that, that you would help us to hear uh, your word, um, receive your word, uh, incarnate your word. In Jesus' name, we ask it. Amen. Well, um, as I was looking at the text for today, um, chewing on it through the week, I just kept getting this uneasiness in my gut, kind of like a pressure. Brought back countless memories of angry letters from angry people, deeply offended at things I'd said, and the agony of wondering whether I was right or I was was wrong, and then the struggle of trying not to be offended at their offense. Brings back countless memories of acquiescing to the religious scruples of Pharisees. And this week it brought back one memory in particular from one particular day around 1985. And just to talk about it, I'm going to risk offending you right now. I'm going to need to say the F word. I asked the staff this week, do you think I can say the F word? I grew up as a pastor's kid who really didn't get the concept of hell, but I was pretty convinced that if you said the F word, you were going there. And now I'm going to say it, the F word. Fart. As a kid, I genuinely thought that was the F word. In my house, you could, you could do it, fart, as long as you didn't enjoy it and, God forbid, you began to laugh. You could do it as long as you said, e- excuse me, but if you did it and appeared to enjoy it, well, my dad, the Reverend Dan Hyatt, just did not approve. The first R-rated movie that I remember, I was allowed to see Bobby Van de Koppel and his dad well, it was so controversial because it included a group of cowboys sitting around a campfire eating beans, passing gas, and people laughing. Blazing saddles. Well, this is the text. Romans 14, verse 13. Now, remember Paul has been talking about the strong in faith, right, who uh, eat meat, and the weak in faith who only eat uh, vegetables. Romans 14, 13. Therefore, let us not judge one another any longer. But rather decide, rather judge to never put a stumbling block or a hindrance, a scandal on an offense in the way of a brother. I know and I'm persuaded in the Lord that nothing is unclean or impure in itself. But it's unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. For if your brother is grieved, saddened, offended by what you eat, you're no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one who for whom the one for whom Christ died. So, so do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it's wrong for anyone to make an another stumble by what he eats. It's good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves, but whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So anyway, I remember sitting in my boss's office, the Reverend Steve 
Marsh. Steve was probably all of 28. I was about 24. Next to me was the best man at my wedding, Dave and Alan's, uh, uh, Dave Jones, Alan and my friend, Dave Jones. And, and we were all vehemently arguing the pros and cons of passing gas. It was 1985. All of us worked at Bel Air Presbyterian Church, Ronald Reagan's church, home of the rich and famous. I was the new high school youth director. Dave was my assistant, and Steve was our boss. If, you, if you've ever tried to lead a 10th grade boys Bible study, you know that it can be incredibly difficult to get those boys to open up until someone passes gas and laughs about it. I didn't have many skills but that was one that I had mastered. And my friend Dave, you can ask Alan, could literally burp the entire alphabet. Great for ministering to 10th grade boys, but problematic for ministering to their parents and to the holy folks that kept us all in business. Steve had just graduated from seminary. Dave and I were still in seminary, and so of course we were all, you know, quoting scripture, just right and left. Now, I'm sure that my recollection is not entirely accurate, but I remember Steve saying something like this. Romans 14, Peter. Your brothers are grieved. They're saddened. They're scandalized. They're offended. So you're not walking in love. Let's pursue what makes for peace. It's wrong to make your brother stumble. Whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Are you certain that you should be just like farting? And I would answer, nothing's unclean in itself. Maybe the 10th grade boys are grieved that you make all these rules about farting. See, it seemed to me that in Paul's terminology, the 10th grade boys who could pass gas and laugh about it while praying were strong in faith. And the anal retentive religious crowd with all the rules about farting were weak in faith. And if that were true, Paul is arguing that the strong in faith shouldn't fart and laugh about it in front of the weak in faith, for that might cause the weak in faith to violate their own conscience and destroy themselves by laughing at farts when they thought that they should be serious about farts, the weak in faith being Steve and the parents. But Steve, Steve was not claiming to be one of the weak in faith, but one of the strong in faith, worried about causing one of the weak in faith, one of the 10th grade boys, to stumble by violating their own conscience. And if that was the case, Steve, well, he did have a point. Paul writes that nothing is unclean in itself, but it's unclean for anyone that thinks it unclean. And I imagine that some of their parents, like my parents, had told their boys, no farting and laughing. And so farting and laughing wasn't just farting and laughing. It was lawlessness. St. Augustine's first confession in the Confessions was taking fruit from a pear tree not because he wanted the fruit, but because it was forbidden. <laughs> In other words, he wanted to assert his, his will, his independent will. And so he and his buddy, probably 10th graders, took the pears from the tree and didn't eat them, just threw them at pigs. When my son Coleman was little, we made a rule. No eating toothpaste. Now, on video, we have videos of Coleman sneaking toothpaste. <laughs> eating alone in the corner. I said, no eating dirt, Coleman, and so Coleman would eat dirt and then hide from me. And I really don't care whether or not Coleman eats dirt or toothpaste, but I die just to convince that boy that he does not need to hide his heart from me. In Rome and Corinth, the weak in faith thought that eating meat was worshiping an idol. But the strong in faith, they knew that eating meat could be just eating meat. But if they led their weaker brothers to eat meat, those weaker brothers might eat meat and then hide their hearts from God, our Father. And so the 10th grade boys might fart, laugh, and then hide their hearts from their parents, or worse, their creator, and yeah, that would destroy them. And yet right in the middle of the text, Paul writes, do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. And so I regarded farting and laughing as good. And now I was willing to educate Steve and the parents and, well, even my dad, if need be. And isn't that exactly what Paul's doing in almost all of his letters? He, he won't eat meat in front of the weak 
until he educates the weak that the meat is good for, and I quote, everything is indeed clean, Romans chapter 14. He won't acquiesce to the scruples of the Pharisees, and yet he won't violate the scruples of the Pharisees if he thinks that they'll listen to the gospel first. I thought Steve was acquiescing to the Pharisees and sacrificing me. And I imagine Steve thought that I was what Karl Barth calls a Pharisee of freedom and more than willing to sacrifice him. And now it all seems silly, right? When talking about farts and bacon. But just substitute some other created thing. For everything created by God is good, right? We said that last week. Substitute some, some other thing for bacon or farts, like wine, whiskey, marijuana, gold, sex, reproduction, gender. Suddenly, nobody's laughing. Or debate other rituals like the Sabbath, baptism, communion, or, or rules for immigration, wealth distribution, officers in the church, soldiers in war, and suddenly... No, nobody's laughing. In regard to the Old Testament, meat sacrificed to idols, no one was laughing in Corinth, or Colossae, or Galatia, or Rome, or Jerusalem. And in regard to farting and, and laughing, no one was laughing in Steve's office that day in 1985. I wouldn't let it go, or I should say I wouldn't stop letting it go. Steve, I remember he was sweating, his eyes were like red, high blood pressure. He looked at me and, and he demanded to know. I remember he looked at me and said, why is it necessary that you fart? And I didn't know what to say. And so I said, well, sometimes I, I just have to. And then Dave really started laughing. And at that, Steve just kind of lost it. And I remember he blurted out, well, I sure wouldn't want to be farting when Jesus comes back. Pretty sure he knows already. And yet it does raise this pivotal question, what happens when we all stand before the throne? God's throne. That is the judgment seat of God also called the judgment seat of Christ, and that would be Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus seemed to violate all sorts of religious uh, scruples. He made wine at a feast where people were already tipsy. Read about that in John chapter two. He healed a guy with spit, knowing full well that bodily excreta, spit, was unclean to the Pharisees based upon Old Testament law. He did all sorts of stuff on the Sabbath and, and ticked off the Pharisees, and yet he died for the Pharisees. One of them being Rabbi Saul, who we call Paul. And now this is really, really weird, but not only did Jesus offend, scandalizo in Greek, he kind of turned the offense into the judgment, <laughs> saying, blessed is he who is not offended at me, and weirdest of all, Jesus not only offended, but all of scripture testifies that he himself is the offense, the scandalon, the proskama, the stumbling block. And, and Paul's fully aware of this. For just a few chapters back in Romans 9, he wrote, and hopefully you remember this, they, Israel, have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling, proskama, and a rock of offense, scandalon, and whoever believes in or on him will not be put to shame. And now Paul, using those very same words, writes this, therefore, let us not judge another any longer, but judge to never put a proskama or scandalon in the way of a brother. Then he concludes by writing, whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. But faith in what? That farting is good or not good? That eating meat is good or not good? That a national abortion ban is good or not good? To fart or not to fart? That is the question, Paul. 
And if you don't have an answer, how could I do either one of them in, in faith? It's all confusing, and yet Paul does begin our text with a therefore, and it's important to always ask, what is the therefore therefore? So let's do that. Romans chapter 14, verse 10, what we preached on last time, why do you judge your brother? Such a frustrating question. I mean, it's obvious, right? Paul, I need to justify myself, and so I obviously need more knowledge of good and evil, for I'm gonna have to stand before the judgment seat of God. Duh! Why do you all judge your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? If we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it's written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me, and every tongue will confess, give praise to God. So then each of us will give account, logos, of himself to God. Therefore, for this reason, let us not judge one another any longer but rather judge to never put a stumbling block, proskama, or hindrance, scandal on in the way of a brother, etc., etc., etc. You see, maybe we've had such a hard time understanding, let alone doing Romans 14, 13 through 23, because hardly anyone, at least in the institutional church, has believed Romans 14, 10 through 12 for, for at least like 1,500 years. But much of the early church, Perhaps most of the early church. Some would say, yeah, most of the early church did. And you see, I did it, at least a little, and have, starting along about the first week of October, 1995. For three years, I've been the senior pastor of a little church on Lookout Mountain. A church that was now growing into a flagship church within our Presbyterian denomination. And this was wild. Every, not everyone, but most people seemed to really like me. I was thrilled, and, 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 and I was exhausted, and I was swamped with anxiety over all the scruples of the Pharisees, and the foremost of the Pharisees, me. I mean, were Pokemon cards good or bad? I, I didn't know. What was wrong? Who was wrong? And who was right? Was I wrong? Was I right? Was I rightly testing the spirits? Or was I quenching the Holy Spirit? Was Lana Bohr a prophet or a false prophet when she told me that God told her to send me to the laughing revival in Toronto, Canada? Now, I want to tell you about something that I've told you about numerous times in bits and pieces. But I haven't told you about all at once in a sermon for many, many years. But before I do, I want to say that some claim to have experiences like this quite often. And I imagine that they're telling the truth. I've only had this experience on this one particular day. And I'm not saying that you need to have this particular experience on any day and yet I am convinced that you will have it on that day, and actually you do every day. And if that's not cryptic enough, let me also remind the Pharisee in you that it's an evil and adulterous generation that seeks for a sign. And to Thomas, the uh, resurrected Christ said, blessed are those who haven't seen and yet believed. And so you don't have to see, but I want you to believe. I want to share with you my Damascus Road experience. I've been chewing on it for 27 years, and I'm constantly reminded of it by Paul, particularly in our studies of, of Romans. Atlanta said, I want to send you to the laughing revival in Canada. And I said, Lana, are you okay if I come back and I just say they're all nuts? And she said, yes. And I said, well, can I bring Susan with me? She said, yes. I said, can we go to Niagara Falls while we're there? She said, yes. I said, well, we're in. We're going. We'll do it. What I witnessed at the conference utterly blew my mind. Because, see, I had seen religious people fake stuff over and over and over again. I grew up in a church. But what I saw, I couldn't explain away. And what they preached, sang, and prayed, I didn't want to explain away. Because well, it was just what I'd been preaching, singing, and praying back home. 
It's just that now folks would suddenly drop to the floor intoxicated with joy or maybe roaring like a lion or doing all kinds of weird stuff. I mean, I even saw a group of middle-aged church ladies that started just laughing hysterically and then farting. Yes, it was like a, like a farting middle-aged woman laugh worship vortex. I mean, it really just blew the doors off of anything that ever happened in the 10th grade boys Bible study at Bel Air Presbyterian Church in 1985. And for an entire week, I would just lift my hands and I would just cry out to God, do me, hit me, fill me with your fire. And nothing. Nada. Not a drop. The first night, I remember Susan, she turned to me and said, Peter, I don't want these people touching me. Someone just walked by her, didn't even touch her, said, God bless you, dear. She like dropped to the floor in a pile she was just gone. And when she came back around, I remember her with tears in her eyes describing me, to me this, like, this ecstasy that God had given her that like, entirely eclipsed our honeymoon. <laughs> I confessed every sin I could think of. I made promises about the numbers of beers that I would now drink and not drink, about the movies I would watch, the movies that I wouldn't watch, and still nothing. I had worked like crazy, studied like crazy, pastored like crazy. Susan didn't even have quiet times. And God takes her on a honeymoon, Jesus takes her on a honeymoon. I was offended. I mean, deeply offended. I was hurt and I told Jesus. I said, you won't even talk to me, so I quit. When I go back to Denver, I'm handing in my, my resignation. But on that day, the last day, I went to a seminary led by a, a Presbyterian guy like me, and I sat next to this really huge Native American guy, Pentecostal guy named Anthony, who was obviously like just tripping out somewhere with Jesus. And on the other side of me was this little old frail Roman Catholic lady named Rosemary. At the end of the seminar, I remember the leader told us, he said, well now just stand up, hold hands, and pray with the person next to you. So I held hands with Anthony and Rosemary, and the next thing I remember was the audible voice of God. <laughs> I had never heard it like this before, and I haven't heard it like this since, but I heard God say, Peter, you don't love my bride very much, do you? And suddenly, I mean instantly, I knew that I had left geology and gone into the ministry because I hated the church. Hated the church because of what the church had done to my dad in a meeting in downtown Denver where I watched him try it on the floor of the Denver Presbytery. Some of you have been to that room. <laughs> There's a story about that too. Because of that and because of what the church had done to me and my family through just a million zillion judgments. And, and so I had judged the church and I had refused to forgive the church and I had somehow vowed to show the church by fixing the church with some sort of secret, twisted, dark hatred for the church. I must have just convulsed and let out a sob because Anthony like laid me down on the ground. And I began to weep and wail uncontrollably. <laughs> I mean, it is uh, quite a shock to suddenly realize that what you had considered your very best deeds and what other considered your very good deeds were actually your worst deeds, even the devil's deeds. And yet, th this was the utterly crazy thing. Although I was utterly convicted and I knew, I knew beyond a shadow of doubt that I had chosen the evil. There was not a drop of condemnation or blame in the voice of the Lord. Only the deepest compassion. In fact, I honestly felt like I wasn't sobbing so much as he was sobbing through me, for me, on behalf of me, even as me, as if he was he was repenting me, and I was just watching, and he felt this profound sorrow for me. He must have sobbed through me for about an hour, for when I opened my eyes, everyone was gone. The hotel staff had set up chairs around my body lying there on the floor in preparation for the evening meeting. 
but I was just kind of lost. But I do remember thinking, wow, he didn't even mention beer or dirty movies. And I had absolutely no idea. Absolutely no idea of the depths of evil in my own heart. Like a stone, a tumor. And I thought, you know, I can't even begin to judge myself, let alone my neighbor. <laughs> Oh, I was just like utterly undone. You see, for a moment, I think I stood before the judgment seat of God and at least a little gave account, or Jesus gave account, of my old man, my tupas, the vessel of wrath, the body of sin and death, my false self, my flesh, my ego. I felt utterly undone, and I wondered if I had had like some kind of mental breakdown or something. I didn't know what to do. Resign, not resign, eat meat, don't eat meat. I didn't know. And for 27 years now, I've wondered what exactly did Jesus mean by my bride? Well, I found my way back to our hotel room where I found Susan, told her what happened, thought I just maybe had lost it or something. She'd had enough wild encounters with God for one day, so she sent me down to the evening meeting alone. I remember I found Rosemary, that Roman Catholic lady, and I just said, would you just pray for me? Um, and you know, I don't fall down. I don't do the fall down thing. I, I said, well, I'll just lie down on my back and maybe you could just pray for me. I remember I laid on my back, my hands in the air, and together, I, I didn't realize this at the time, but together we prayed an Eastern Orthodox prayer. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And as we were praying, I remember I began to feel this like tingling in my fingers. You know, like when a body part, you sleep on your arm and it cuts off the blood going to the arm and the nerves kind of stop. But then when the blood starts to flow again, it comes awake and it starts to tingle. And I remember thinking, okay, this is weird because now my whole body is like tingling. And then I remember someone walked by and said, God, Lord, let it, let it come in waves. And then it was like pulses of electricity shooting through my body. And, and, then, and then I noticed this pressure on my wrists as I held them in the air. And, and before long, I realized that my hands were like being held in place in the air. And I sincerely thought that, that God was going to break my arms. And remember, I was just thrilled. I was thrilled. I've always been a skeptic, and so I thought, well, this will be irrefutable, conclusive proof for the existence of God. It wasn't for a few weeks that, that I remembered that I'd always prayed, Lord, I can't, seem to, I can't seem to hear your voice. So if I'm ever out of your will, just break my arms. And it was early day, that day that, that I prayed, Jesus, you, you don't talk to me, so I'm quitting. <laughs> I'm leaving the ministry. Well, I was absolutely aware that he could break my arms. And that knowledge is still a huge comfort to me to this day. Because what does it mean? It means God's not held hostage by my bad choices and my bad decisions. He has the capacity to set me back on the path. He's utterly capable of breaking my arms. But he didn't break my arms. And yet the energy, the presence, the love was so intense that I really thought he might kill me. I was just like totally cool with that. But I was also aware that I might be not be totally cool with that. I, I might be utterly terrified of that if I hadn't already begun to realize that I knew him. And he knew, he knew me. So I could probably yell stop and he would stop, but I didn't want him to stop. It was not a feeling that I had conjured up in my brain. It was not the result of my will, my obedience. In fact, he had just revealed my disobedience a few hours before. It was not a religious technique or a protocol or a method that I'd learned in some meeting. It was not knowledge of good and evil that I'd taken from some book or, or a tree. It, and now I should say he, was a presence more real than space and time. And this is the thunderclap. I knew him because 
he knew me. I remember thinking, you know, it's not about tingling fingers and audible voices and manifestations, so pay attention to what he's showing you. And I remember this distinct impression in my mind. Peter, it's not about this. It's not about signs, but who they point to. And that's me. And you know me. And then it was as if God pulled back a curtain on all of my reality and I, I awoke. I woke up to reality. I knew I saw at least a bit that he was absolutely everywhere, all the time, loving me, loving me. And I had been least aware of his love when I most believed that I had to earn it. He pulled back the curtain and I couldn't help but thank him. I mean, I just started thanking him and I couldn't stop. I remember thanking him. I just thanked him for everything, everything. I remember in particular thanking him for a Sunday school teacher and the flannel graph because he showed me that he was the flannel graph Jesus. <laughs> and I knew him because he knew me through those felt characters in a flannel graph and the love of my teacher. He knew me and I knew him. I remember thanking him for Bono and U2 because I used to hate Christian music. But I'd sit in my old Mustang and I'd just listen to U2 and I'd think about Jesus and Jesus showed me that my every good thought was him speaking to me and in me and from the depths of me and through me. He pulled back the curtain and I couldn't help but praise God because I absolutely wanted to praise God or maybe Jesus wanted to praise God through me. I mean, it was hard to tell if I was speaking or he was speaking through me and as me, the, the word of God, the logos of God, my creator. You see, for at least a moment, I think I stood before the judgment seat of God and gave account, logon, logos of myself, the Jesus of myself. My, my true self, the vessel of mercy, the new man, the eschatos Adam. I gave myself, my true self, to God. I don't know how long the experience lasted in space and time, and yet the reality is eternal. It's every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is within them, praising the one on the throne and the Lamb. And check this out, that reality is here. It's now. And so he confronts you every day in a smile, a hug, maybe a glazed donut down by the coffee. And he speaks through you every day with a smile or through a hug or a glazed donut that you hand to your neighbor with just a, a smidgen of love. Because that didn't come from you. And yet it is you. When I got back to Colorado for about a month, I found it literally impossible to worry. Weirdest experience of my life. It was as if my heart was utterly convinced that I was thoroughly known, entirely loved, and God, who, who liked me a lot, was in absolute control. But then surrounded by the river of lies, they can read about in the Revelation, it seemed to kind of like wear off. And yet I still remember the truth. And for 27 years I've been reflecting on the truth and finding the truth just like all over scripture, particularly in, in the book of Romans. You see, I think what happened to Paul on the road of, to Damascus, at least to some measure, happened to me <laughs> in a hotel room in Toronto, Canada. And since that day, some things have just become entirely obvious. Number one, I am utterly incapable of judging myself, let alone my neighbor. But God will judge. God will judge the hell out of me and his heaven into me, and nothing is better than God's judgment. So far from teaching people to run from God's judgment, I'm going to always encourage you to run into his judgment, to run right into the judgment of God. In other words, run into the arms of Jesus. Number two, I'm utterly incapable of judging you, and yet I do know that you are far worse than you ever imagined. And so you really can't shock me anymore. 
and you are infinitely better than you can even begin to believe. In other words, what I've been telling you this whole time, you really do have an old man, a body of sin and death, and it's far worse than you ever imagined. And one day you will ceaselessly praise God for delivering you from it, that is, yourself. And that now you, that you that constantly praises him, somehow is him and an absolute gift from him and is infinitely better than anything you could even begin to imagine. In fact, your experience of your old man will cause you to endlessly praise God in ecstasy for your new man and as the new man. In other words, where sin increased, grace will abound and has abounded all the more, and God's grace in you is faith, hope, and love in you, the judgment of God in you. The old man is constructed with your judgment. That's called your sin. And the new man is constructed with God's judgment, absolute grace. The old man is a dream that turns into a nightmare, a shadow of who it is that I am is. The new man is who I am and we are, the image and likeness of God. Number three, I realized I couldn't judge, but I could preach that God's judgment is good in the hope that we would all would surrender to God's judgment. It was obvious to me that God wasn't finished with me, but that he would finish me. And that in every moment I worshiped God and surrendered to his word, he was judging the hell out of me and heaven into me. And number four, I couldn't judge, but I hoped that everyone would be judged by God. In fact, I kept asking him for quite some time. I kept asking him, God, you did that for Paul. God, you did that for me. I've got some crazy stories. I, I saw you do that for others. Why wouldn't you do it for all? And for 27 years now, I think God's been asking me, yeah, good question, Peter. Why wouldn't I do it for all? Particularly when I keep saying I will do it for all. Romans 4, verse 12, as I live. Now, God is swearing, okay? God's swearing, and his swear word is Jesus. As I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me, and every tongue will confess, will give praise to God. So then each of us, each of us will give account, a logos of himself to God. Therefore, for this reason, let us not judge one another any longer, but rather judge to never put a stumbling block, proskama, or hindrance, scandal on in the way of a brother. So what is the stumbling block? What is the stumbling stone? Well, it's this, isn't it? This is the stumbling stone. This is the, the tree in the middle of the garden. This is Jesus the Christ and him crucified. The judgment of God, the commandment of God, the word of God. It was God that planted that tree in the middle of the garden. It was God that consigned all to disobedience in order that he may have mercy on all. It was God who decided, as in Adam, all die, so in Christ will all be made alive. It was God who said, let us make man, Adam, humanity, in our own image. It was grace that taught your heart to fear, and grace your fears relieved. This is the judgment of God. And it doesn't belong to you. God does not tempt to evil, but he does, and he did, lead us into temptation that we might choose the evil and come to know that we are forever chosen by the good who is himself, grace. This is the judgment of God. This is love and it doesn't belong to you. And yet, God had chosen to give it, to give himself to you. This is the stumbling stone, the foundation stone, the cornerstone. But what does it mean for me 
to place a stumbling stone in front of you. Well, isn't it for me to point to this tree, or this tree, (laughs) and say, you know, we ought to take some more knowledge of good and evil from this tree. Maybe we ought to make some more laws, you know, some more regulations. More ways to judge God and judge each other. And isn't that how I encourage you to manufacture more old man, which only imprisons the new man deeper and deeper in fear and shame? See him there imprisoned like a baby in a womb? (laughs) Deliver us from the evil. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. In 1 Corinthians 8, Paul talks about all the things, the things that he talks about here in Romans 14. I mean, stumbling blocks, food offered to idols. But he begins the discussion with this fascinating verse that we read last time. 1 Corinthians 8, 1. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, makes you arrogant. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something. 37 years ago in Steve Marsh's office, we were all imagining that we knew something, and we were desperate to know who was wrong and who was right. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. You see, I can entice people to take knowledge from the tree in order to justify themselves and in this way crucify Christ, destroy the life, and manufacture the evil. I can lead folks into temptation. Or I can testify to God's judgment, Jesus Christ crucified and risen from the dead, and when people surrender to Christ, the living Christ, our husband, they are impregnated with Christ and give birth to Christ, the love of God in human flesh. In other words, I can live by the law and everything will die. Or I can surrender to love and all creation will live. Romans 14, 13. Therefore, let us not judge one another any longer, but rather judge not to tempt people into judging each other. Next verse. I know and am persuaded in the Lord that nothing is unclean in itself, but it's unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you're no longer walking in love, but what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. And now I'm going to read the more literal. So do not let the good of you be blasphemed. For the kingdom of God is not a manner of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it's wrong for anyone eating through stumbling. It's good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything in which your brother stumbles. The faith you have, keep between yourself and God. In other words, don't turn your faith or your experience into rules and regulations for other people to follow. Blessed is the one not judging himself in what he approves. That is, blessed is the one who stopped judging himself. To the Corinthians, Paul wrote this. It's a very small thing that I'm judged by any of you. I don't even judge myself. But I'm not thereby acquitted. It's the Lord who judges me. See, even St. Paul didn't know exactly, and you can see this from reading the Scripture, even Paul didn't know exactly what, what was wrong and what was right. Next verse. But whoever has doubts is condemned, that is, damned if he eats, because the eating's not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Faith 
In what? I mean, what if I don't have faith that eating meat is okay, and I don't have faith that not eating meat and eating only vegetables is okay? What then? I mean, it sounds like I'm, I'm damned if I fart, and I'm damned if I hold my farts. And maybe I am. Because either way, I'm not farting in faith. Don't deny it. You all fart. But do you fart in faith? Whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Faith in what? Maybe we should be asking faith in whom? You know, faith means trust. If your faith is in knowledge that you can keep in your head, you know the way you keep math knowledge in your head so you can pass a test later on? If, if, if faith is in knowledge, I, I bet you're trusting yourself as the Savior. But if your faith is in Christ, you're trusting the life who is the good. You're trusting your helper, your husband, who is with you, as I was nailed to the floor by the power of God, and as I realized my old man was dead and my new man just now would not stop worshiping, and I was happier than I've ever been before or since. I remember I yelled at Rosemary, I yelled, Jesus just called me a dork. And I remember she looked at me with this concerned face, she said, oh honey, Jesus would never call you that. And I thought, well, whatever. But I knew exactly what he meant. He was speaking my language and he did call me a dork. He was speaking 10th grade boy high school language. He said, Peter, stop being a dork. Stop doubting my love for you. Do you know why I was so intent on justifying myself in Steve's office that day? I didn't believe I was justified. <laughs> to be more precise, I didn't really believe Jesus loved me. <laughs> and do you know why Steve was so intent on correcting me? I bet it was the exact same reason. He didn't really believe Jesus loved him. So which one of us was right and which one was wrong? Well, we were both far worse than we knew and far more right than we could imagine. The worst was on us and all the righteousness was God. You say, fine, but who was right and who was wrong about farting? I don't know. And right now, I think I'm not supposed to know. It wouldn't surprise me, though, to find out that one day that, that I was farting because I hated the church. And Steve could tell. Steve is a great guy who has a lot of wisdom. And... It wouldn't surprise me now to find out that I was farting because Jesus was actually loving Billy Baldridge and Brennan Bluestein and Mike and Steve and all those 10th grade boys through me, his body. <laughs> and it wouldn't surprise me in the least to find that both of those things, both of those scenarios were true and happening at exactly the same time in exactly the same place. And yet the good and the evil cannot be separated with knowledge in my head, for it only buries me deeper in sin and shame. The good and the evil can only be separated by standing before the throne, the judgment seat of God, and listening to his word as he says to me and he says to you, now would you believe I love you? This is my body, which is for you. This is the covenant, the marriage covenant in my blood. 
Drink of it. Drink of it, all of you. You're his bride, church. So stop doubting his love for you. I think he's been showing me that all humanity will be his church, his body, his, his bride. But to be honest, I, I think the hardest thing for me to believe is that I am his bride. Peter, you don't love my bride very much, do you? That has just crucified my old man. Peter, stop being a dork. Shabbat, stop. Sabbath, stop that. Stop doubting my love for you. Stop doubting my love for you. See, that's the resurrection of the eternal man. I am the Lord's beloved. That's who I am. Am. And so may you stand before the judgment seat of God right now. And so, Lord God, you are love, and your word is love, and your word in flesh is Jesus. And Lord Jesus, you are with us. You say you will not leave us nor forsake us. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you are the judgment of God upon humanity. And so we praise God for you, Lord Jesus, standing on the throne, loving us. And so, Jesus, we invite you to lead us. So, Lord God, if you want to lead us into the desert for 40 years, go ahead and do that. If you want to knock us all down, do the thing like on Pentecost, I'd prefer that, that would be great. But we offer ourselves to you as a sacrifice, holy and acceptable, because you are good. And it's your name, it's in your name that we know the Father, that we praise, that we worship, that we live. Amen. I shared this story at my father's funeral, and you would believe Paulette's here. She knew my dad. My dad, who would not let me say the F word. She knew, she knew my dad, but she would testify to this story that's true. Shortly before my dad uh, passed away, I took him on a presbytery retreat, and uh, we shared a bed and a room. Earlier in the evening, we'd gone to dinner with Gary Reddish and Aram Haratunian and ordered this big onion dip. And I ate almost all of it. That night, I just couldn't contain myself. And so finally, I remember I rolled over to my dad. I said, Dad, I'm so sorry. I, I just, I, I don't know. I just, I have really bad gas. And remember, my 83-year-old dad, he got like all animated. And he like, he, I think he turned on the light. He turned on the light. He grabbed me by the face. He stared me in the eyes. And he said, Peter, Peter, you God made your body. Your body is a wonderful thing. You don't ever have to apologize to me for your bodily functions. Peter, you're wonderful. I remember I just looked up and went, um, okay, Dad. So if you don't get any of this message or you thought it just stunk, this is my point. <laughs> Love can make the stinkiest farts smell sweet. So believe the gospel and breathe free. The gospel is not anal retentiveness. And the gospel is not anal expressiveness. <laughs> the gospel is love in freedom. That's called grace. In Jesus' name, believe it. Amen.